Hello everybody, I am Alkida Baliu and this talk is entitled The Ubiquity of Delta Coloring and very soon I will explain what it is about. But first of all, let me mention that this talk is mainly based on some results that we achieved in the last three years. Some appeared in Fox and Potsy, while some others are still unpublished. All the results presented in this talk hold in the local model of distributed computing. In this model, we have a network that is modeled by a graph where nodes represent computing entities and edges communication links. We will denote with n the number of nodes in the graph and with delta the maximum degree. In this model, we assume that messages can be arbitrarily large and also we do not restrict the local computation. Hence, this is a very strong model and this means that if we prove lower bounds in this model, then they hold in weaker models as well. In this talk, we will see how the delta vertex coloring problem is strictly related to many other symmetry breaking problems that have been studied in the literature, such as dominating sets, MIS, ruling sets, and artifactive colorings. Also, we will see how delta coloring is related to questions regarding complexity theory, and in particular, to an open question regarding a well-studied class of problems called locally checkable labelings. Let me remind you briefly what a delta coloring is. We have a graph, and delta is the maximum degree of the graph. We want to color the nodes with delta colors, that is, assign to each node a color from a palette of delta colors, such that neighbors do not have the same color. In the example, delta is 4. Let's start by looking at how the delta coloring problem is related to the complexity theory of LCLs. LCLs are a class of problems introduced by Nauer and Stockmayer in the 90s. These are a class of problems for which it holds that, given a solution, nodes can check in constant time if the solution is correct. Meaning that if the solution is incorrect, there must be at least one node that detects some inconsistency. LCLs are actually a bit more restricting than this, and in particular, for these problems, we assume to be in a graph of constant degree and we assume that the possible inputs and outputs of the nodes come from a set of constant size. LCLs have been studied extensively in the last years and there has been lots of progress in establishing a complexity theory for these problems. In particular, we know that some complexities are not possible at all and for example, in this picture, the orange regions depict complexity gaps. For instance, this orange region represents the fact that there are no LCLs that have complexity that is at the same time little omega of 1 and little o of log log star n, neither for deterministic nor for randomized algorithms. Although we understood a lot about LCLs, there are still some open questions. In fact, for example, we still don't know what happens in this region. This region is interesting because it is one of the few cases where we know that randomness can help. In particular, this is a region containing problems that require at least log n and at most poly log n for deterministic algorithms, but for which we also know that they can be solved exponentially faster with randomized algorithms, that is, with a complexity that lays between log log n and poly log log n. Unfortunately, we still don't know if there are actually problems in this white region, that is, we do not know any problem that has a little o of log n randomized upper bound for which we also have a little omega of log n deterministic lower bound. 
So this is one of the major open questions related to locally checkable problems. Now, while we do not have any problem for which we have a proof that it is strictly contained in this white region, we have some good candidates, such as the delta coloring problem. In fact, for this problem, we know that in bounded degree graphs, there is a very fast randomized algorithm that requires only poly log log n rounds in the local model. For this problem, for deterministic algorithms, while we know an omega of log n lower bound, we only know an order of log square n upper bound. So understanding the right complexity of delta coloring could help in understanding something more general about locally checkable problems. Let me give you a very high level idea of where this log square n comes from. The current best upper bound works roughly as follows. It first starts by computing a delta plus one coloring that on bounded degree graphs can be done very efficiently in order of log star n rounds. Then it tries to get rid of one color. One main component for achieving this part is to use as a subroutine an algorithm for computing ruling sets. That is a family of problems that I will introduce later. In particular, in order to compute a two log n ruling set, the current best algorithm requires order of log n rounds and the log squared n in the complexity of the delta coloring problem comes from the fact that this kind of ruling set is computed on g to the power of log n, that is the log nth power of the graph. Hence, if we could improve the algorithm for computing a ruling set, then we could directly improve the algorithm for delta coloring. Keeping this in mind, during Sirocco 2019, when the conferences were still being held physically, with Sebastian Brandt and Dennis Olivetti, we tried to improve the complexity of ruling sets. Hence, to recap, we wanted to understand the ruling sets in order to better understand delta coloring. And we wanted to understand delta coloring in order to better understand LCLs. Unfortunately, we failed. We could not find any better upper bound. So we started to think that maybe this problem is actually hard. And hence, we started to think about lower bounds. Before going any further, let me introduce alpha beta ruling sets. An alpha beta ruling set is a subset of the nodes of the graph such that the distance between each pair of nodes in the set is at least alpha. And each node not in the ruling set has a node in the set at distance at, mo at most beta. For example, in the figure is depicted a 2-3 ruling set where the nodes in the set are the blue ones. The family of ruling set problems includes a classical graph problem that is the maximal independent set problem. And please note that I am talking about maximal independent set and not maximum. That is, we want an independent set that cannot be further extended. Maximal independent set is equivalent to a 2-1 ruling set. Alpha equals 2 means that the nodes in the ruling set must not be neighbors. And beta equals 1 means that each node not in the ruling set must have at least one neighbor in the ruling set. This is exactly the definition of MIS. MIS is a classical example of a problem that can be easily solved in linear time with a greedy algorithm in the centralized setting but obtaining efficient algorithms in the distributed setting is challenging. Let's see a bit more in detail the role of these parameters alpha and beta in the family of ruling set problems. As already mentioned before, a 2-1 ruling set is equivalent to the maximal independent set problem. 
Ruling sets may only become easier as alpha decreases, since alpha is a distance lower bound. In fact, for example, a solution for a 5 beta ruling set is also a valid solution for all alpha beta ruling set with alpha less than 5. And since our goal is to prove lower bounds, we will focus on 2 beta ruling sets, as a lower bound for 2 beta ruling sets directly applies also for ruling sets with larger alpha. On the other hand, since beta is a distance upper bound, the larger is beta, the easier this problem may become. In fact, a solution for the 2-1 ruling set problem is also a valid solution for 2 beta ruling sets with beta larger than 1. Hence, MIS is the hardest 2 beta ruling set. Therefore, understanding 2 beta ruling sets is strongly connected with understanding MIS. But what did we know about MIS in 2019? We discovered in 2019 that for deterministic algorithms, MIS requires omega of log n over log log n rounds. This result follows directly from a lower bound of the same complexity for the maximal matching problem. The reason is that computing a maximal matching of a graph G is equivalent to computing a maximal independent set in the line graph of G. The line graph H of a graph G is constructed as follows. We put a node in H for each edge in G, and we connect two nodes in H if they are connected to the same node in G. Hence, this lower bound for MIS does not hold on, for example, trees, but it only holds on line graphs. In 2019, on trees, the only known lower bound for MIS was the omega of log star n1 of lineal that we know from the 80s. The maximal matching lower bound has been proved by using a promising technique called automatic round elimination, for which I will talk later more in detail. To recap, we wanted to understand two beta ruling sets but we already knew that we could not just adapt the existing lower bound, since on line graphs it was known that two beta ruling sets, for beta strictly larger than one, could be solved very efficiently, that is, in just order of log star n rounds. So we were in the following situation. We knew that MIS is hard on line graphs. We knew that ruling sets are easy on line graphs, so we wanted to find a genuinely different lower bound proof for the hardness of MIS that could also be extended to ruling sets. For this purpose, we needed to find a lower bound for MIS that did not exploit the hardness of maximal matching. The most promising technique that we had at the time and that we maybe still have nowadays for proving lower bounds in the local model is the so-called automatic round elimination technique. With this technique, we are able to show lower bounds that hold even on trees. So our goal was to understand the MIS problem directly on trees through round elimination. In 2019, we had just started to better understand the round elimination technique. And this was also thanks to a paper from Sebastian Brandt, who showed an automatic way to apply round elimination. More precisely, he showed that given a locally checkable problem P that has round complexity T, even if T is not known, it is possible to construct in an automatic way a problem P prime that is exactly one round easier. I am not going to show how this construction is done, but instead, in this talk, we will use this result as a black box. So let's see how to prove lower bounds by using this technique. Suppose we want to show a lower bound for our problem of interest 
that is P0. We start from P0 and by applying automatic round elimination, we create a sequence of problems, P1, P2 and so on, such that each problem PI is at least one round easier than the previous problem in the sequence. Now assume we managed to do this for k times and imagine also that we prove that the last problem of the sequence, that is pk, cannot be solved in zero rounds. Then by a chain of implications we get that p0 cannot be solved in k rounds and hence we obtain a lower bound of k plus 1 rounds for p0. Therefore, the longer is the lower bound sequence that we are able to construct, the stronger is the lower bound that we prove. The challenge that we face when we try to use the automatic round elimination technique for proving lower bounds is the exponential growth on the size of the description of the problems of the lower bound sequence. In fact, we start from our problem of interest P0 that we usually can describe in the automatic round elimination framework in a compact way. Then we apply the round elimination technique that gives us a problem P1 that is exactly one round easier than P0. The size of the description of P1 is very often exponentially or even doubly exponentially larger than the one of P0. And if we continue to apply automatic round elimination, we are faced very soon with a problem the size of the description of which is very huge and often not even feasible to compute. Moreover, this exponential growth on the size of the description of the problems makes it very difficult to understand the structure of each problem in the lower bound sequence and hence we are somehow stuck. Let me show you with an example what is this exponential growth on the size of the description of each problem that I'm talking about. For this purpose, let's see first how to encode MIS in the round elimination framework. In this framework, we encode problems in the following way. We have a label for each half edge and then we have a list of allowed node and edge configurations. Suppose we want to encode MIS on a four regular graph. Nodes in the MIS output the configuration MMMM on their incident half edges. This configuration indicates that these nodes are in the MIS. Then, in order to guarantee maximality, we require that each node that is not in the MIS proves that it has at least one neighbor in the MIS. We encode this by requiring nodes not in the set to output a pointer to a neighbor in the MIS. And for this, we use the label P. Hence, each node not in the MIS must output one P on one incident half edge. And on the edge configuration side, we must allow the configuration PM. In this case, we say that P is compatible with M. Then, on the other incident half edges, nodes not in the MIS output the label U. You can think of this label as an unconstrained label. Since nodes not in the MIS may be neighbors, and since they may have more than one neighbor in the MIS, then we must allow UU and UM as valid edge configurations. In order to write allowed configurations in a compact way, we would write UM and UU in the following way that indicates that U is compatible with both M and U. Note that since two nodes in the MIS cannot be neighbors, we do not allow the configuration MM on the edges. Also, notice that this is just one possible way to encode MIS under the automatic round elimination framework. But there are other valid possible encodings as well. 
Now let's see how does the size of the description of the problems of a lower bound sequence grow. If we start from the MIS one. And in order to see this, let's forget about edge configurations and let's focus only on the allowed node configurations. I'm not going to show how this sequence is actually computed, but you can just think to a black box where we can give in input some problem, in this case MIS, and get the next problem of the sequence as output. If we start from MIS and we apply automatic round elimination, we get the following problem P1. P1 contains the two configurations of the MIS problem plus other two ones, which makes a total of four allowed configurations. Notice that it makes sense that P1 allows more configurations, since it is easier than MIS. We continue and we apply automatic round elimination on P1 and we get problem P2 that contains 11 allowed configurations. Even if we know what P2 is, it seems challenging to understand what this problem actually is. In other words, it seems challenging to be able to describe P2 in a human understandable way. And if we continue any further, we would get a problem that is too large and unreadable. Just so to convey the idea, let me just say that problem P3 contains 114 many allowed configurations. Now, MIS is a problem that still behaves quite nicely since it does not grow full exponentially. But there are problems that behave way worse like coloring problems, where even just computing two steps is unfeasible. So I hope that I convinced you that being able to use automatic round elimination means finding a way to deal with this explosion of the size of the description of the problems. In the following, we will see some methods and tricks that have been used to deal with this issue. One approach that has worked in maintaining the description of each problem small while still being able to prove interesting lower bounds is the similarity approach. On a very high level, the similarity approach works as follows. We start from our problem of interest P0, we apply automatic round elimination and obtain problem P1. Then we take a look back at P0 and we try to relax problem P1 to a problem that resembles P0 and hence that is described in a compact way. Relaxing P1 means to construct another problem P1 starting from P1 such that P1 is at most as hard as P1, but it may be potentially easier than P1. Hence, a solution to P1 is also a solution to P1. Relaxing a problem of the lower bound sequence needs some care, since by constructing a problem that can be potentially easier than P1, we may obtain a problem that is too easy, and hence we may then only be able to construct a very short lower bound sequence of problems and therefore obtain a weak lower bound. But assuming that we do not lose much precision, we continue with this process and we apply automatic round elimination on P1 and obtain problem P2. Again, we look at P1 and try to modify, hence relax, P2 such that it resembles P1, and hence such that it has a compact description. We continue to iteratively apply automatic round elimination plus relaxation through similarity. And at the end, we get our lower bound sequence that starts from P0 and contains all relaxed problems that have a compact description. Notice that if we use the similarity approach, since each problem is relaxed in such a way that it resembles the previous one, 
then we get a lower bound sequence of problems that do not have any growth in the size of the description, which is quite nice. The similarity approach has worked for showing a lower bound for the maximal matching problem. In fact, in 2019, we showed a lower bound for maximal matching that holds on two colored bipartite graphs. More precisely, we encoded maximal matching on bipartite two colored graphs by providing allowed node configurations for each side of the bipartition. And then we showed a lower bound by using automatic round elimination plus the similarity approach. Let me give you a bit more intuition about this approach by showing how we applied it on maximal matching in this context. I'm not going into details on the encoding of maximal matching on bipartite two colored graphs. And moreover, for the sake of simplicity, I will start by a problem that is a relaxation of maximal matching on bipartite graphs. If we show a lower bound for this relaxed version, then we of course get the same lower bound for the maximal matching problem. Suppose the nodes in the bipartite graph are colored white and black. We encode the relaxed version of the maximal matching problem through allowed configurations for white and black nodes as shown in the slide. Hence, we start from this problem. We apply the automatic round elimination technique and we get problem P1. The differences between P1 and P0 are shown in orange. Let's take a closer look at the configurations of white nodes in P1. The new configuration is quite similar to one of the configurations of P0, where instead of a P there is a U, but most importantly, instead of an X, there is a new label Y. The idea is to try to relax the problem in such a way that the new label disappears. This way P1 would be quite similar to P0. More precisely, what we can do is to merge X and Y. Merging two labels means that whenever one of the two appears in some configuration, we allow also the other. In this way, the two labels become equivalent and at that point we can just discard one of the two. In this case, we keep X and we discard Y. Notice that merging two labels can only make the problem potentially easier. I am omitting some details here, but if we merge X and Y in P1, we get problem P prime one. The difference between P prime one and P zero is shown in red. And as you can see, P prime one and P zero are quite similar. Both have the same number of labels and the same number of configurations. And also the only thing that differs is a single configuration and in only one single place. We now apply this approach iteratively. We start from P prime one and we apply round elimination. Similarly as before, we get more configurations and more labels. We again merge X and Y and we get P prime two where the only difference from P prime one that is shown in red is just on one single place. Let us see just one more step. We start from P prime two, we apply round elimination and we perform some merging. Again, the obtained problem differs only on one single place. So let's zoom out a bit. We start from a relaxation of maximal matching. We applied three steps of automatic round elimination plus some relaxations, and we got a problem that is still very similar to the original one. Here we considered a specific case, that is when delta equals six. But we actually know that for maximal matching and some of its variants, for any value of delta, we can repeat this same process that we just saw, that is, apply round elimination and merge X and Y for a number of times that is proportional to delta, 
and still obtain a problem that is not zero runs solvable. This means that we can construct a lower bound sequence of problems that gives a tight lower bound for maximal matching and variance by keeping all problems of the sequence very small. So in some sense, the maximal matching problem behaves very nicely under the round elimination framework. And this allowed us to understand this problem quite a lot. In fact, this kind of technique has been used in two papers that have shown tight lower bounds for maximal matching and some of its variants. Unfortunately, the similarity approach does not seem to work directly for MIS, in the sense that if we try to perform relaxations aiming to keep the problems always of the same size, then we reach a zero round solvable problem only after a constant number of steps. I emphasize the word directly here, and as for the reason why, I will get to it a bit later. So for now, let's just focus on the fact that it seems challenging to use the similarity approach for MIS. With the similarity approach, we managed to have no growth at all in the description of the problem, which is great, but maybe it is too demanding for some problem, such as MIS. So we might want to loosen a bit our requirements. In fact, maybe a linear growth could be good enough. In the similarity approach, the current problem of the sequence suggests how to relax the next one. But what could be a possible approach that allows us to find the sequence of problems such that at each step, the size of the description of the problem grows only linearly? Here is one interesting approach that has worked in the past for achieving this goal, and it consists of the following. We first find an upper bound through automatic round elimination, and then we let the upper bound sequence suggest the proper relaxations for getting a lower bound sequence. This approach may seem really strange at first, so let me try to give the idea of why it makes sense and what we are trying to achieve here. When we apply automatic round elimination, we get a problem that is exactly one round easier. And in particular, we get the same allowed configurations of the previous problem plus additional ones. Some configurations among the additional ones are the ones that actually contribute in making the problem easier, while some others seem to be just an artifact of the round elimination process. Somehow, we would like to be able to recognize which configurations really make the problem easier, because those are the ones where we do not want to perform any relaxation, as otherwise we would make the problem too easy. One way to recognize these configurations is to try to find an upper bound sequence. The configurations that appear in an upper bound sequence are the ones that we do not want to relax. But before saying more about this, let me say some words on how automatic round elimination can be used to obtain upper bounds as well. We start from problem P0 and by applying automatic round elimination, we create a sequence of problems P prime one, P prime two, and so on, such that each problem P prime I is at most one round easier than the previous problem in the sequence. This can be achieved by doing the opposite of what we do in the case of a lower bound sequence. That is, instead of performing relaxations at each step, after applying round elimination, we make the problem potentially harder instead of making it potentially easier. Now, assume we manage to do this for k times. And imagine also that we prove that the last problem of the sequence, that is p prime k, can be solved in zero rounds. Then, by a chain of implications, we get that p0 can be solved in k rounds, and hence we obtain an upper bound of k rounds for p0. 
Therefore, the shorter is the upper bound sequence that we are able to construct, the better is the upper bound that we get. One may ask if it's actually easier to find an upper bound sequence instead of a lower bound one. And well, sometimes in round elimination, finding an upper bound is easier than finding a lower bound. And the reason is that in some cases, performing relaxations, that is what we do for lower bounds, can be more tricky than performing those modifications that make the problem harder, which is what we do for finding upper bounds. And we will see later an example. So let's see the high level idea of this from upper to lower bound approach. Suppose we have found an upper bound sequence of problems using round elimination. Now we want to construct a lower bound sequence of problems starting from our problem of interest P0. We first apply the automatic round elimination technique and we get problem P1. Now Pi1 suggests how to modify P1 and we get a problem P prime one that is potentially easier than P1 and that the size of the description of which is just a bit larger than the one of P0. Then we continue, we apply around elimination starting from P prime one and we get a problem P prime two. Then inspired by the structure of problem Pi two of the upper bound sequence, we modify P prime two and reduce by a lot the size of its description. We continue to iteratively apply automatic round elimination plus relaxations inspired by the upper bound sequence. And at the end, we get our lower bound sequence that starts from P zero and contains all relaxed problems that have a somewhat compact description. This approach has been used for showing a lower bound of omega of square root log n over beta log log n rounds for MIS and two beta rolling sets. This lower bound holds already on trees and it holds for a large range of the parameter beta. Perhaps surprisingly, the upper bound sequence that we got actually asymptotically matches the best known upper bound for ruling sets. This lower bound, though, does not match the upper bound. Now, let me show you how we got the upper bound sequence for MIS. We saw towards the beginning of this talk a way to encode MIS in the round elimination framework. Again, let us focus only on the node configurations. So we start from MIS and then we apply automatic round elimination and we get problem P1. Let's take a closer look at P1 and let's try to give a human understandable interpretation of what are these configurations. First of all, we know that MMMM represents nodes in the MIS and PUUU represents nodes that are not in the MIS but that have at least a neighbor in the MIS. Moreover, the emphasized configurations MMMM and AAAA can actually be interpreted as colors. In fact, on the edges, we do not allow MM, since two nodes in the MIS cannot be neighbors. But it happens that in P1, it is not allowed neither AA. On the other hand, MA is an allowed configuration. Hence, we could see these configurations as colors. Nodes with the same color cannot be neighbors, but nodes with different colors can. And what about this other configuration? Well, this one we do not really understand much. So let's just remove it from the allowed configurations. Notice that by allowing less configurations, we are restricting further the problem. Hence, we get a problem that is potentially harder. And if we can show an upper bound for a sequence of harder problems, then that upper bound holds for the initial problem of interest as well. Okay, so we now apply again round elimination and we get problem P prime two. 
This problem contains a new color in its allowed configurations, plus some other configurations that we do not understand. Hence, we modify the problem by keeping the new color and by removing the other configurations. And we continue in this way by applying iteratively round elimination plus modifications that may harden the problems. Let's make some observations about this sequence of problems. We start by a problem that contains one color. And at each step, we get a problem that contains a new color. Hence, in delta steps, we get a problem that is solvable in zero rounds given a delta plus one coloring in input. And this essentially gives a linear in delta upper bound for MIS. The upper bound sequence that we constructed for ruling sets is very similar in spirit to what we just saw. And that resulted in an upper bound that asymptotically matches the existing best upper bound for ruling sets. Now, in order to prove a lower bound for MIS and for ruling sets, we started from the upper bound sequence and we tried to follow the same similarity approach that we saw before for maximal matching. But now, instead of trying to make the problem similar to the previous problem of the lower bound sequence, we try to make it similar to the corresponding problem in the upper bound sequence. I am not going into details on this, but we can make relaxations and obtain a lower bound sequence like the one shown in the slide. And it is very similar to the upper bound sequence, where the only difference is that we have an additional label shown in red. This label is somehow special. It is compatible with any other label. And in fact, we call this label a wild card. This approach of converting an upper bound sequence into a lower bound one worked for MIS and ruling sets. The obtained lower bound sequence exhibits a linear growth on the size of the problems, since at each step we obtain an additional allowed color. One could ask, is this linear growth really necessary? Or can we prove the same lower bound for MIS? by using a lower bound sequence where the size of the problems does not grow at all, like in the case of maximal matching. Hence, as promised, let me get back to the fact that the similarity approach does not seem to work directly for MIS. And let me explain why I emphasize the word directly. In the case of maximal matching, what really happened and what really helped in obtained a nice lower bound sequence by using the similarity approach was the fact that we actually considered the bipartite maximal matching problem and not just maximal matching. That is, we assume to be in bipartite two colored graphs and we describe the problem by listing allowed black and white configurations. If we consider instead the standard maximal matching problem, we know that it's not that easy to obtain such a nice lower bound sequence. And this somehow suggests that considering a setting where nodes have inputs may help to prove lower bounds with round elimination. So we try to think about what could be an input that could be useful to prove a lower bound for MIS. The idea here is that, again, we start from P0 and we perform round elimination obtaining P1. Now we are not going to see an example of this, but we can exploit some inputs to map some configurations into different configurations. In this way, we are able to reduce the total number of allowed configurations while still obtaining a problem that is more relaxed. And then we can repeat this and obtain a lower bound sequence. For MIS, the input that turned out to be useful was a delta edge coloring. What we obtained is a stronger and simpler lower bound for MIS that holds even in the case in which nodes are provided with a delta edge coloring in input. Unfortunately, the same approach seems not to work for ruling sets. And we still do not know what kind of inputs could be useful for ruling sets. 
In general, we still have to really understand when is it that this approach works. The last approach for dealing with exponential growth that we will see in this talk and that has been used to prove lower bounds is actually the simplest one among all the ones that we have seen so far. We start from a problem P0 and for some reason, if we apply round elimination, we obtain P0 again. This means that we can repeat the same process again as many times as we want, obtaining an arbitrarily large lower bound sequence. We call this kind of problems fixed points. There are few problems that exhibit this nice behavior. But what one could also do is to start from the problem of interest, try to perform few steps of round elimination, then perform some relaxations, and then reach a problem that is a fixed point. For all fixed point problems, we know that it holds a log n deterministic lower bound and a log log n randomized lower bound. An example of a fixed point is the sinkless orientation problem. In fact, if we start from sinkless orientation and we apply round elimination, we again get sinkless orientation. However, not all problems that require omega of log n deterministic rounds are a fixed point. For example, if we start from delta coloring and we apply round elimination, we do not get the delta coloring problem again but something more relaxed. One important open question related to round elimination is to actually understand if, for all problems that require omega of log n deterministic rounds, there exists a relaxation that gives a fixed point. If this were to be true, this would give a standard way for proving hardness results. We we'll still do not know if this is the case. And at that time, we wondered whether the statement holds for delta coloring. But for delta coloring, we already knew that it requires omega of log n rounds for deterministic algorithms and omega of log log n rounds for randomized ones. So why do we care about a fixed point proof for the hardness of delta coloring? In order to answer this question, let me go back to the MIS problem. And let's see more in details what happens when we apply round elimination on MIS. At the beginning, we have MMMM that, as said earlier, can be seen as a color. And we have PUUU that is used by nodes not in the MIS to prove that they have at least one neighbor in the MIS. We then apply round elimination we get a problem that contains two colors, the pointer line and then an additional configuration that we consider to be garbage, that is, some artifact of the round elimination process. We then apply round elimination again. We get a problem that contains three colors, the pointer line and a lot of garbage. In general, after k steps, we get a problem containing k plus one colors, the pointer line and a lot of garbage. This observation is crucial. Somehow this suggests that since we apply round elimination to some problem that is nothing else than a relaxation of the k coloring problem, we obtain at least the same garbage that we would obtain when applying round elimination directly on the k coloring problem. Hence, this suggests that if we want to understand MIS, we first have to understand k-coloring. And the most relaxed version of k-coloring that is still a hard problem is delta coloring. Hence, at this point, together with Sebastian Brandt, Fabian Kuhn and Dennis Olivetti, we understood that in order to understand how to keep the problems in lower bound sequence of MIS small, we first had to understand how to keep the problems in a lower bound sequence of delta coloring small. And what is the best thing that we can wish for a problem that requires omega flow and deterministic rounds, such as delta coloring? 
Well, a fixed point, since it is a trivial lower bound sequence where the problem does not change at all. So let's recap. We wanted to understand delta coloring in order to better understand the landscape of LCIs. For this reason, we started to study ruling sets because they are used as a subroutine in the current best delta coloring upper bound. In order to understand the ruling sets, we first try to focus on MIS because it is the hardest two beta ruling set. But for understanding MIS, we first had to find a way to prove a lower bound for delta coloring through round elimination, because somehow the delta coloring problem appears as a subproblem in the lower bound sequence of MIS. Note that at this point, we knew that understanding delta coloring was necessary to understand MIS, but we do not know if it was actually sufficient. So back to the question, is there a fixed point for delta coloring? The answer is yes. And let's see how this fixed point looks like with an example. This problem is a relaxation of the delta coloring problem where delta is 3, and colors are A, B, and C. Moreover, this problem satisfies that if we apply round elimination on it, we obtain the exact same problem. Hence, it is a fixed point. This fixed point can be intuitively described as follows. First of all, each label is a subset of the original colors. Then, on the edge side, two labels are compatible if they are disjoint sets. For example, the label set AB is compatible with the label set C. On the node side, every configuration is obtained by putting some set some amount of times and then the empty set some other amount of times. The number of empty sets in a configuration is always equal to the size of the first set minus one. For example, consider the configuration AB, AB empty set. The size of the set in this configuration is two. Hence, the number of empty set labels is one. While in this other line, we have two empty sets, since the size of the set present in this configuration is three. Okay. So we got a fixed point for delta coloring. Now what? It turned out that the same exact idea could be applied to the case of MIS. In fact, we define the following family of problems characterized by a parameter K. There is one pointer configuration, there are K colors, and then there are the same allowed configurations that are present in the fixed point of K coloring. Notice that if we take k equals 1, we get exactly the MIS problem. We then prove that if we take the problem with parameter k and we apply round elimination, we obtain a problem that can be relaxed to the problem with parameter k plus 1, that hence contains one pointer configuration plus the same allowed configurations of the fixed point of k plus 1 coloring. In this way, we get a nice lower bound sequence. Even more interestingly, it turned out that the same idea works for obtaining lower bounds for a much larger family of problems that I am not going to describe because it even contains many problems that have no intuitive meaning. But I am going to describe a nice subfamily of problems for which we obtain lower bounds with this method. We call them alpha arb defective C colored beta ruling sets. In this problem, nodes can either be colored or uncolored. The graph induced by colored nodes must be colored with an alpha arb defective C coloring, and uncolored nodes must have a colored node at distance at most beta. For example, the picture shows a two arb defective, two colored, two ruling set. For these problems, we proved lower bounds that turned out to be tight. 
This is a very nice family of problems. In fact, we directly get many lower bounds for very different problems. We actually get a unified proof for both existing and new results. In fact, by setting alpha to 0 and c to 1, we get that colored nodes must form an independent set, and we hence obtain tight lower bounds for two beta ruling sets. And if we set beta to 1, we get a tight lower bound for MIS. If, on the other hand, we set beta and c to 1, we obtain lower bounds for bounded out degree dominating sets which are a variant of dominating sets. Instead, if we set beta to zero, we get that all nodes must be colored, and hence we obtain lower bounds for alpha arb defective C colorings. And if we set alpha to zero and C to delta, we get the fixed point for delta coloring. Here are some concrete results that we obtained. For MIS, we finally managed to prove that unless we spend a high dependency on n, this problem requires a number of rounds that is linear in delta, even on trees. And if we express this bound solely as a function of n, we obtain a lower bound of omega of log n over log log n, which turned out to be tight on trees. Similarly, for ruling sets, we obtained tight lower bounds as a function of delta and tight lower bounds as a function of n on trees for a large range of beta. Then we also managed to exactly characterize which variants of ARP defective coloring can be solved in order of f of delta plus log star n for some function f and which of them require omega of log in base delta of n. So we exactly characterized which variants are in some sense easy and which of them are in some sense hard. What is shown here are just a few examples of the results we got thanks to the discovery of the fixed point of the delta coloring problem. And our results apply to many other symmetry breaking problems. I will conclude now with some open questions. In general, despite the progress in the last years, we are still far from truly understanding the round elimination technique. Hence, there are many open questions related to it, but I will only list a few of them. The first question regards the delta coloring problem. As already mentioned, we know that delta coloring requires omega flow gain rounds with deterministic algorithms in the local model. On the other hand, the best upper bound has complexity order of log square n. This upper bound uses ruling sets as a subroutine, and now we know that we cannot further improve the complexity of ruling sets. Hence, can we find a genuinely new algorithm for delta coloring, or can we show that it actually requires little omega of log n rounds? Another question that we would like to understand is related to LCLs, and we would like to know if there are problems that can be solved in little o of log n with randomized algorithms that require little omega of log n for deterministic algorithms. Unfortunately, we currently do not know how to prove such lower bounds. In fact, the current limit of the round elimination technique is that the best lower bounds that we can prove are omega flow gain for deterministic algorithms and omega flow log gain for randomized ones. The third and last question also regards round elimination. One of the few ways that we have to prove that a problem requires omega flow gain is to show a relaxation of the problem that is a fixed point in the round elimination framework. What we do not know is if this is always possible. And hence, we would like to understand if, for all problems that are omega flow n, there exists a relaxation that is a fixed point. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this video.